painted your paintings. Um, were you using models from old photographs? No, I, I do everything from memory. Is, is that right? Yeah. I, I'll, have, I'll have reference for the uniforms, but I don't copy anything. I just use them as reference. And once in a while, my son posed for some of these, some of these guys oh, you're yeah, seeing. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, yeah. He's a very good model. Yeah, but it seems like you have a real interest in the Civil War. Oh, yeah. Well, all, all American history, but in particular Civil War, yes. I've done articles on the First World War, Second World War, and uh, I, did, I did one on um, the Revolution. There it is. He did that for my son. <laughs> <laughs> that was just an oil sketch. It takes one of the Union uh, soldiers? Yeah. Yes, the blue. The gray is the uh, South. No, I have something in, the, in that large the book there that well, you can take, uh, it's, it's a synopsis, and you can use that in, uh, in, in your article if you want to. Oh. Hey, hon, will you bring up the big book? Which one? The big, the big one. The, the, big one, one here? the big one, yeah. Yeah, I won't get too historical on you, though. Just... <laughs> what do you want to do with it? Oh, I, I have to get something out of it oh. for him. Just excuse okay. me a second. Now. God, we got books of all things. When any of my friend's children got married, oh, they didn't want the money. This is the Poughkeepsie the Journal. So they all have a painting. Oh. This, this may help you in, in, in uh, writing your article. Oh, great. Oops. oops, 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 oops. Okay, we get it. Thank you. Yeah. Background sheet. <laughs> yeah, it's all there. Actually, Tony was telling me before. Tony, weren't you saying before you went into the regular army, you were yes. with the 14th yes. New York? Yes, right at the Pearl Harbor, and I enlisted with them, and um, thinking that they were going to be mustered to federal service quickly, but they, they weren't right away. The, the original regiment was already gone. Then they formed a new regiment. That's the one I was in, and um, I found out the nine months that they, they weren't quite ready to, to go into federal service. Mm -hmm. So I, went, I enlisted in the regular army. So he actually was in the regiment, the uh, descended, same regiment as in the painting, but uh, the 14th, yeah. uh -huh. 80 years later. I was part of it. An awful lot of pride in that outfit. Even, even the successor units had a lot of pride. Would you, like to, would you like to get a shot of Mr. Mattia holding one of the paintings, perhaps? Would that be good for you? Want a small one? Which one do you want? Too staged? Which one do you want? Okay. Okay. Want me to hold the painting? All right. Well, so we're we're yeah, one, of, one of the 14th. Now how about this one? Yeah, that looks good. I think oh, the torn flag? That's a colorful one, yeah. Oh, this, this is a beauty. Yeah. No, is that okay? Can you... Oh, did, you did, 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 within range? Yes. Tony made Christmas cards for him. Was I always had a beat about, World War, about the Civil War. And I think I've actually come across a couple of those. You probably have. Yeah. Papers. And then he drew a picture of him. And when he died, his daughter put it in the. I don't well, know. this, well, this is, uh, it's, yeah, it was used as a frontispiece piece for an article, a magazine. I was used as a frontispiece. piece, but it, it depicts the 14th. In, in, they were in, they were in, uh, I think, 19 engagers with the enemy. Is that right? The Civil War, yeah. Yeah, they were almost decimated at Gettysburg in the first. Oh, okay. no, they started out from Brooklyn in 1861 with no, about 900 men, hmm. and when they come back, when they were out of federal service, they come home to Brooklyn. There were fewer than 100 men marched in the parade. Wow. The rest of them were either captured, dead, or, um, or missing. Wow. Those flags are particularly significant, too. I think I, I heard Mike telling you before about the one on the left, the regimental flag. You're going to have that one in the uh, museum? Or? Yeah, that, well, we have it. It's been uh, conserved. And, oh, wow. uh, it's on that one I should display. smile, shouldn't I? Uh, <laughs> is it in the glass case, I hope? Yes, it is. Yes. Oh, good. And, good. But the two, the two smaller ones are very interesting, too. Um, because those were called marker flags or, or guide flags. Uh -huh. And um, you know, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, the reason they all stood like shoulder to shoulder and shot close at each other standing up was because we just didn't know any better. Mm. That's so, right. But they had to do that because of the way the weapons were in those days. If you didn't stand shoulder to shoulder and fire, you couldn't get any kind of accuracy or if, an impact on your enemy. I see. And there's so much smoke coming out of the black powder of these things. Mm -hmm. that the only way you could tell whether you went to the right place or your unit was going forward or back was by reference to those flags. The two big ones in the middle and the two little ones on the sides. Okay. That's how you could tell whether, you know, we're winning, we're losing, and where I'm supposed to be. Because uh -huh. you couldn't see anything else with all the smoke.
I learned something just now also. That's one thing about World War II. We were spread out. It was, but most, most of World War II was fought on the highways. Yes. So we, 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 we uh, very, very seldom did we come in, into, uh, into close contact with the enemy. Uh, and uh, it was okay with me, you know. This one-on-one -on -one business is terrible. But we had um, a lot of action, but it was not, not very close. You were in the Army in, uh, during the war in Europe? Or? In Italy, uh, Africa and Italy. Tell them what you did in the Army. Well, they, they, they yanked me out of the infantry and made me a, a, a well, I had experience in, in drawing. I was a, I was a map overlay maker. Oh, what? Yeah. Ma 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 making map overlays. Also with the New York State Military Museum. In fact, he still keeps the fourth court together, whoever... Yeah, we still have reunions. After all these years, we still Since have reunions. We meet, we meet about every year or two. So what is your unit again? The, uh... yeah, headquarters, Fourth Corps. We were part of the Fifth Army. You're familiar with that, Colonel, right? Right, yeah. Fifth Army. Yeah. Mark Clark. Oh, yeah. Mark Clark. Yeah. Right in the way up to boot of Italy. Was your, was your rank, Anthony, when you got that? Sergeant. Sergeant. It was, oh, I, see, I was an artillery officer. I know the importance of those overlays. Yes. That tells you, you know, the things that the map doesn't, and everything changes, and you can't keep changing maps. So the overlays tell you what's going on. I got you. Yeah. They're kind of clear, so you lay them on top of the, the map. Updates. They kind of gives you the update. The field, field, excuse me, Colonel. The, the field, the field commanders. Just think of this now. They're in a strange country, in the dark. They don't know where they go, and sometimes they just, they just. I mean, it's not, it's not chaos, but it's just, it's a tough job. So what our job was, and my section was engineering maps. Now we, we used aerial photographs and we had patrols went out. All the intelligence that came back to us, we, we would put right on those maps, whatever we, we had a bridge out, road, road closed, blah, 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 whatever it was. And we uh, had a, uh, a, a hand-operated machine to make copies of the, of the overlays, tracing paper. Now those maps were referenced and the coordinates were referenced and those and they were copies were given to the commanders and they put it over their map, and they knew that don't go this way, go this way. You know, somebody's got to tell them where to go. And of course, the, the over, overall, the overhead, uh, uh, as the for example in our case, a colonel in, in charge of the engineering, roads and bridges. So before anything went out, he had to approve everything. And um, uh, it, it was a responsibility that, that, that we just had to take seriously. And sometimes he sent us up closer to the line that we get the, the latest bit of intelligence to put on those overlays. And um, I was up with the, with the 10th Mountain Division one night and uh, with the 34th Infantry Division two, for two nights in a row where the artillery was, was brutal. But we, we sat in a pyramid tent with a, a Coleman gasoline lantern, my friend and I, and we were, we were just making overlays. This guy, Next to me, Sergeant Bond, oh. always had a bottle of wine under the, <laughs> under the drawing board with him. And um, there, was, there was always a humor attached to this, too, you know. And he used to say, don't worry about these shells whistling overhead. Why? Well, what do you mean, don't worry? Because my father was in the First World War, and he said, you'll never hear the one that hits you. And I said, you know, I says, Ted, I says, I feel better now, she told me. <laughs> I really feel better, you know. That's the kind of a guy he was. Teddy, tell him what you did after the war was over. You couldn't go home right away. Yeah. What? What you couldn't do after the war was over. You couldn't go home. Oh, yeah. So why don't, why don't we begin the interview and get this stuff yeah, Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> sure. Whatever you want to do. Yes. I'm, I'm going to start uh, very informally with some informal sure. questions. OK. Then, Take the vote and sit down, Kathy. Okay. Uh, this is an interview Friday, April 12th, year 2002, approximately 10.30 a.m. at the home of Anthony Batillo, Hyde Park, New York. Uh, Mr. Batillo served with the 4th Corps, 5th Army, North Africa, Italy, United States Army. He served for three and a half years? Yes, sir. Okay. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Uh, when and where were you born, sir? In Brooklyn, New York, on June 7th, 1917. Okay. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your pre-war education? Well, I went to uh, Harron High School in Manhattan. <clears throat> I went to the 
Art Students League in Manhattan. I attended there for a couple of years. And I went to the National Tech Institute to study um, mechanical engineering, drawing. Okay. Um, can you tell me about Pearl Harbor, when you first heard about it, and where were you? I was um, out duck hunting that day on the, on the North Shore of Long Island with some friends. And we did not have a radio in the car. So when we got finished hunting, coming back to Brooklyn, uh, we were just talking about the Jap envoys in Washington, and we were hoping that they could make some kind of a deal. And uh, then I got home and I got in for supper time, and my sister-in-law says to me, we're at war. He says, what? You know, that's how I found out. And what was your reaction? I was, I was surprised that they attacked. But I wasn't surprised that we were going to be in a war. I knew we were going to, sooner or later, we were going to be in But uh, this, the Pearl Harbor was just as big a shock as 9-11 as to, to, to my generation. Really, it was very, very bad. And when you look at the casualty, uh, it was 20, I think it was 2,400 at Pearl Harbor, and this is this, this little under, under 3,000 in New York and Wa in Washington and Pennsylvania. But, um, you, know, you know, it was a shock to us all, yeah. Uh, when did you enter service? R right, shortly at the Pearl Harbor. Uh, so you volunteered? Yes. How old were you when you uh, volunteered? 25. Why did you pick the Army? I like this. I just like the Army. Okay, why don't you uh, start maybe in a chronological order telling about your basic training, when and where, okay. and your unit assignment? Basic training started in Camp Shelby, Mississippi in um, October of 1942. And after basic training, <clears throat> I was assigned to the 4th Corps headquarters in um, Camp Beauregard, Louisiana. And there is where they found out that I, I had engineering drawing experience, and they asked me to go into the engineer section of the Corps to do overlays and other things too. After, after we, our European campaigns were over, they asked me to do combat illustration. And I did several publications for the Army. The main reason why they didn't send me home when the, when the, when the Corps went home, they wanted me to finish up a uh, history of, um, of the Italian campaigns, you know, written and illustrated. But they kept me there about six more months. I didn't mind. We were having a lot of fun. I was single, you know. Girls, wine, woman, and song, you know. My wife didn't know me then. <laughs> so... Um, well, that, that was, it, it was a good experience, very good. Now, in, uh, in basic training, the 85th Infantry Division, it, it was tough going. For three months, we had real, I mean, they really told us in plain English, you civilian idiots are going to be soldiers in, within six to eight weeks. And they weren't kidding. They weren't kidding. They, they gave us, they put us through all the, all the, um, all the training you could think of, like, for example, get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and walk to a swamp. Very, very interesting, you know, things like that. And going through, um, you've heard of the machine gun courses? You remember that in World War II? Well, there were two machine guns mounted on a high stand uh, where they just went across each other. And the, it was live ammo, <coughs> and it was about 20 minutes of crawling. And I went through that thing in Mississippi. <clears throat> then I was transferred to the Fourth Corps, and we went to the state of Washington. And uh, they told us we we're going to go through that thing. And that goes on your record, as you probably know, gentlemen. It goes on your record. So I said to the first sergeant the morning we were supposed to go out for this machine gun course. I said, you know, sergeant, I took this already. Do I have to take it again? He says, get your butt in there. <laughs> so uh, we got in there, and it was a second time. Then we went down to California after that Washington stint. And um, the commanding officer says, everybody goes through the machine gun course at night. So I says to the first sergeant, y y y yeah, what do you think? He said, yeah, yeah, you're coming with me. So uh, we're going through the, we went through the course together. And uh, I was holding the barbed wire up so he can get through, you know. And somebody else was holding it up, so that's, you know, buddy system, you know. And, um, and he, he was, he was, 
cranky the whole time. Maybe he was squawking about it. I don't want to use the word bitching. That's what he was doing the whole time. I says, I says, what did you? I says, what did you think the army was? A picnic? This is the uh, this is the real army. He says, yeah, I guess you're right. Well, anyway, I went through that thing three times. And I, I did I did three 25 mile hikes three times. And every time I I said, well, this is on my record already. Good, you know, you'd be on it twice now. And so, so three of those marches, you know. Well, that was fun. Well, after the basic training, I think um, uh, I have to admit this, that, that we were a bunch of untrained. I mean, they, they, the, the government did a great job of making the NAMI fast, very fast. I mean, within six months, we, had, we, were, we, were, in, we were in in thick into the war, as you may recall. And uh, I never regretted the tough training we had because it paid off. What they were trying to teach us more than anything else was survival. Believe it or not, this this this, this lieutenant I had as a training officer says to me, you know, he says, you got to be skillful to survive, not just lucky. You got to be. You got to use your use your head, otherwise you won't make it. One of the things they did was put us in foxholes, holding up targets in the, in the morning. I was out in the desert, in California. And um, he says, you don't come out of the holes until you're relieved, because there's live ammunition flying around. Go, oh, put your head up. Don't, don't be nosy. Well, that taught us how to stay down. Then if the firing was all over, and I knew there was time to eat. We were still in the foxholes. Nobody, nobody says come out, so you didn't get out. So 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we just had breakfast that day, the guys were in the hold. And when the lieutenant came around, he said, OK, you guys can come out now. I says, I start squawking. I says, you know, I says, we, we're, we're starved. He says, that's what you have to learn in combat. He says, stay where you are until you're safe to come out. And if you don't eat, you don't eat. You'd rather be eating dead or, or, or hungry and or living. You know, that's the way they put it to us. But you see, you see the point, what they were doing? That was tough. Anything else you want to talk about? Well, um, what happened after basic training? As I said, I went to Camp Oregon, I joined the Fourth Corps. And they found, as I said, they found out about my drafting and, and engineering drawing experience, and they put me in the engineer section, and I learned an awful lot there. It was very good. I was under, under um, a, a colonel by the name of Gillette, who was very, um, very uh, good engineer. He was very uh, experienced in, in building, um, in building uh, airstrips in the Pacific. And he joined us in California and uh, later on, and uh, he became the commanding officer of, um, of the engineer section. Our co overall commander was, was a, a we, we, he joined us in Africa, Gen General Crittenberger. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was um, a major general at the time. He took command of the Corps in Italy and put us through three campaigns from, from Naples all the way up to uh, the French-Swiss border when the war ended. And he, I, I admired him because he and Patton come up together in rank in, from West Point on. Patton was the big theatrical type, you know. Crittenberger says, I'm not going to lose men. I'm going to win without losing a lot of men. And I, this, I admired him. I, I remember I used to do maps for him, too, and, uh, and I used to hear him say to his, his staff, you know, if we go this way, it's going to be there, uh, bad. If we go this way, we can still get there, and we're not going to lose so many men. He was very concerned about his men, and he lost two sons in the war. So he, he, he felt it, you know. Yeah. Uh, we st he stayed with us for the whole, whole thing, and, we were, and one of the things about him that I have to mention is that we were in the area where Mussolini was was trying to save his tail. Now Mussolini uh, was was ousted, as you know, and he was heading for Swiss border <clears throat> in a German convoy. And he had with him his his mistress and five fascist officials, and they were they had fifty million dollars in gold bullion in the truck with them. They were trying to get into, this, into Switzerland, where they would have been a safe haven, you know? So Crittenberger 
send his MPs out and let's get this guy. Then all of a sudden, the German commander of the of the uh, Northern Army of of, uh, of uh, the Nazis wanted to talk surrender. So the press says to him, "What's more important, catching Mussolini or taking this guy surrender?" He said, "Look, I'm a corps commander, and an army wants to surrender to me with uh, I don't know 180,000 men, whatever it was. I forgot the number." He said, no, he says, I'll, I'll put the priority on this on the surrender. He says, the MPs will get him. Well, they didn't get him. The Italian partisans, the underground, stopped the convoy. Now, there are only about several hundred of them, and a whole German convoy, I don't know how many men there, but he, they, he outnumbered the Italian underground. But the Italian underground commander bluffed and told him he had many, many more men behind the hills. So, well, you better, you better do what I tell you. What do you want to do? He says, we want to search the convoy. They went through the trucks. They found Mussolini sitting in the back of one of the trucks with the, with the canvas over it with a, a German corporal's overcoat over him, trying to, trying to hide himself. You know. And they took him out and they found out who he was. They took him and his girlfriend and the five officials. And they kept him in a, a villa overnight. And the next morning, they summarily shot him, just like that. They put the bodies in the van, a moving van, and brought them into Milan and um, hung them up by their heels outside of a, a gas station under construction with a canopy over it. If you get that one, honey, get that one with um, the one of the magazines, I have a picture in it. Yes, sir. Of that. Could you go back a little bit sure. to, uh, to North Africa? What, what campaigns were you in no, there? No, we got to North Africa. The African campaign was just about over. Oh, it was just a uh -huh. minute cleanup stages. The reason why they sent us there, because they, the, the army did not know for sure whether we were going to go to Italy or to India. So we were set to go to the Suez Canal to India. And we got to Algeria from Morocco, from Casablanca, we went to uh, <coughs> Oran, North Africa, where we, <coughs> our officer's command changed. And uh, we were told then, just to, they didn't tell us where, they just, just board, board ships. And we went on a, on a 21 ship convoy to Italy. At that time, the, the main front was at the Casino. You recall that name. The Anzio Beach had, a, had already established itself, but they, they were stalled. So we were in the campaign. Our first campaign was to break out the Anzio Beachhead. And um, on May 11th, 1944, we, did, we, we knew something big was happening. We didn't know exactly what. But on, a, on 11 o'clock that night, a barrage started from the west, the Mediterranean side of Italy to the Adriatic side, which is about 100 miles. British, American, South, Australian, you name it, South Africans, they were all, all in there together. There was a barrage of artillery that lasted for two hours. And, and during that time, we moved in with trucks in blackout, doing about 10, 15 miles an hour. And we moved under, that, under the umbrella of um, our missiles that lasted for two hours. And we didn't know where we were going. We had no idea. But the next morning, uh, pandemonium ensued. When troops from, from all nations were running all over the place, and finally the, the beachhead broke out. And then the, then the, then the, real, the real campaign started for uh, the attack on Rome. And Hitler had said to his people, that the Gustav Line, which was a terrific fortification south of Rome, all the way across Italy, was, was impregnable. He says, they'll never get through. Well, we got through. And the entry into Rome was um, something that you just will never forget if you experience I mean, here was a country that was supposed to be supposedly our enemy. And we got a welcome in, in, in Rome. That, I, I could, you know, you ever hear somebody hitting a, a home run at Yankee Stadium? Yes. That's what it sounded like. You know, it was just, just great coming in. But we didn't stay long. We stayed about a few hours, and 
and the, uh, the, the city was declared open, an open city by the Germans because they, the, uh, oh, the pressure was on to not, not to destroy Rome. So we would have we would have hit it with artillery and, and, and air bombing if we had to, but we didn't want to. So they, we gave them three days to pack and get out. And they did. They went 50 miles north of Rome, where the war resumed. From there on in, it was um, another campaign called the um, Rome Arno, the Arno River that goes through uh, Florence. That campaign took took a couple months. Then from there, we went to the North Apennines campaign. That was the winter of 44-45, um, of where we were really bogged down. The, it was, we were losing more, more men with sickness and um, car and truck accidents than we did on the line. That's, that's how bad it was, that's how bad it was stalemated. But then in the spring of uh, April, matter of fact, this time of the year, of 1945, Crittenberger and Clark, and they all got together there, and, and we broke out into the Po Valley. And we crossed the Po River, and um, uh, that wasn't too long after that when the when the surrender came and Mussolini was captured. Where is that? Where is that magazine? On where is she? Where is she? Um, when when you were in the, the winter of forty four forty five, were you equipped for the winter? Did you have winter? Oh yes, gear yes, we were, we were pretty good as best as, be, as best be expected. Yes, uh -huh. we had good good coats and blankets and whatnot. You know, you got you got to also realize that we were not allowed to make any fires keep warm. Uh -huh. We just had to uh, bundle up. Sometimes you, well, one of the finest things we could find was newspaper. We put newspaper on the ground. Then we put our raincoat over that. And then blankets and the, there it is. You can pass this around. That's the photograph. Did you witness, witness this yes, at all? Yes, yes. Yeah, we were, we, we, there were um, a few of us on the Jeep, and we were in Milan, and a um, terrific crowd of people. I say from, can you see that house over there, the, the, that greenish house over there? That's about as far as I got, as close as I got to Mussolini. Mm -hmm. or, or just a mass of people there, civilians. So there's a British uh, military policeman there, and he, and he says to us, look, Yanks, if I were you, I get out of here. I said, what's the matter? He says, this crowd is not, is not, is not, too, um, not too calm. He says, we expect some kind of trouble here today. Well, fortunately, the, the people that were on our side outnumbered the few fascists left. Well, they were diehards, you know. They were almost as bad as the Nazis, you know. But um, no, no, nothing really happened there. What they did do is take the bodies down in the van again and bury them mm -hmm. in a place unknown. They didn't want to make martyrs out of them, especially Mussolini. Huh? So his own wife didn't know where he was buried. I don't think she cared, but but to, he, he was buried with his mistress, you know, so he wasn't a nice guy. He wasn't. <laughs> he was Hitler. What well, can you tell us about some of your combat experiences? Well, I told you about the uh, about eating the tent with Sergeant Bond and his bottle of wine. That, that, that was a good one. <laughs> and, um, oh, um, Colonel Gillette sent me up on the line one day to do some drawings of tramways. You know what tramways are. And the reason why the, we, this, we were still in the mountains. Now, in those, in those, in those mountains, um, the roads were windy, narrow and whatnot, and getting down into a valley and up again, you know, Italy has 700 miles of mountains. So, you know, uh, anyway, they built these tramways because they could go from, from one mountain to the other without all that, all that highway that road business, you know. And what they did was send supplies over, what, they, what the guys really needed. And on the, on the way back, they didn't come back yet, they come back with wounded and dead. 
and uh, it was it was a great thing. So I, he sent me out. So that sent me out there to make drawings of these things. Photographing them couldn't be good because you know it's 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 um it's so far away. All he can all he can photograph is the the mechanism on one side. Well, in the drawing, what I did was show this side, and, and you could you could just you know draw the line just the way you wanted to, and then I would make a drawing of the other side and uh, put them together and, and you had the complete picture. Uh, so while I was there, I was, the Americans ran one and the Brazilian, we had, you know, Brazil was in the war with us too, you know that. The Brazilian troops were holding, um, were, were taking care of one. So I was with them one day. And while I was there, we got shelled. So I had to get into the bunker with these Brazilian soldiers. And it was around, four o'clock in the afternoon. Now I did I made some very rough sketches of the tramway. Going back to, when I got back to my, my post, I would do them over again in ink. Well anyway, while I was in there they they start bringing out some cheese, Italian cheese, and bottles of wine and whatnot and garlic and what you name it. So when I got back to the camp it was dark. And Colonel Gillette met me by the tent and he says, he put his arms around me, he says, son, are you all right? I said, yes, I'm fine. He, I says, what happened? He says, we, we heard about the shelling up there. He says, what happened? I said, no, I, said, I was in a bunker with the Brazilians. He says, you know what? He says, you smell just like them. <laughs> <laughs> Were you allowed to keep any of the drawings that you made during that time? Not the originals, mm -hmm. no. I, I had copies of them. Do you know what happened to your original drawings? The army took them away. The Fifth Army Headquarters took them, and I understand. I, I was told later when we had a reunion in New York City, the one in '52, and uh, this, this, this um, uh, one officer says to me, "You know," he says, <clears throat> "Those tramway drawings are being used in Korea as a basis of how to do this from one mountain to another." I said, it's "Still good." He says, "Oh yeah, they're, they're they still do them the same way." So that that made me feel good too. Okay, what happened after the Po Valley? You said that was you. Yeah, it was the last campaign. Surrender came there, and of course, surrender in Germany came eight uh -huh. days later. And uh, we, as I said, my group stayed to do historical documentation. Now, it, it, it wasn't just the, the war and the fighting itself. We also had to document what the engineers did in Italy, the number of bridges that they put up, well, barely bridges, temporary bridges, and the number of um, Call was to, everything that was everything that we did repairs. This was all had to do with, uh, in other words, an accountability. Had to go back to Washington as to what we did over there. Why did we spend all this money? And of course, you know, when soldiers broke somebody's fence, you know who paid for it. Well, the all those bombings, you know. Uh, I I recall that um, I have, a matter of fact, I had a, I saw a clipping recently of. Um, Casino. After we had to be left casino, and the war was over, the United States Army actually built United States government really built a village. Those people that were bombed out, they built they built new houses for them. So this is the accountability we had to give to to the government. And, and it, this took about you know, four or five months. The war ended in May. I got home December first. Um, when did you uh, leave service? December 1st? December 1st, 45. What was uh, the reaction when you returned home on your part and your family? And the first thing I did, we got to Camp, Camp Patrick Henry, Virginia. I went to post exchange and bought a quart of milk. I sat down on the steps outside and I drank most of it. We had no milk at all in Europe or Africa, no milk at all. And I'm not a milk drinker, but I just wanted milk. This felt like it. And I kept saying to my friends over there, I said, you know, I can't wait till I get home. I says, I just like to have a ham on rye. I says, I just, I just miss it. You know, go down to Coney Island and have a hot dog, something like that. Then I met my wife who would be, a few months later, who uh, gave the first thing she cooked me was a roast beef dinner on a Saturday. And I says, I'm, I'm going to marry her. She's a good cook. <laughs> That's not the only reason. 
what do you think was uh, your most memorable memorable experience while you were in service? Well, there were a few of them. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you, yeah, I'll t one of them was, uh, I would, I'll tell you this because everybody's familiar with the book of the greatest generation. Now, I had a story for him, for uh, Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw. I just, and I didn't know he was doing this book. I would have gladly submitted this to him. I'm sure he would have used it. Here's the way it went. <clears throat> there was a fellow close to me in the Army. His name is Hendrickson. His first name is Arvo. Now, he was from uh, Upper Michigan, farmer, farm family. And he and his brother, <clears throat> twin brother Arno, Arvo and Arno, which we the same day, and an older brother who was 35 years old. And when they went to the, to the draft board, they asked if they could be put together in the same unit. And the draft board says, no, we just had a very bad experience. The Sullivan brothers were lost on one ship. He says, no more brothers together. Okay. So um, Arvo came to my unit, and he, he said, you know, he says, my brother, his older brother, not the young, not the twin, the older brother is in um, in Italy, in a different different unit. So there was a terrific fight going on around a place called Santa Maria, south of Rome. <clears throat> As we were going through, in transit, we stopped. Truck stopped. There was a, a, a kitchen for for transients. It was, it was a big uh, Italian barn or, or warehouse, whatever you want to call it. So we then had a kitchen set up. We were in our own mess kits and eating. And um, as we were going through the line, we saw this huge uh, rack of shelves with American Army duffel bags packed on there. And, and Hendrickson says to me, hey, Tony, you know what? He says, my brother must be in the area somewhere. There's his duffel bag. But his name is stenciled on, you know. So I didn't say anything. I said, oh, that's nice. We were going through the line, and I was thinking, why is this duffel bag there? Well, there was a, a military police uh, guarding these bags. So uh, after the uh, lunch was over, he went to wash his mess kit and went outside to the truck. And I went back to the MP. And I says to him, can I ask you a question? He says, what, what are these bags doing here? And I told him about Hendrickson. He says, well, he says, I don't know if you want to tell him. He's, these guys are all dead. They were all killed at Santa Maria. Must have been about a hundred bags up there, you know. So I didn't say anything to him. I had to, I had to really do some soul searching. I says, why, why am I going to upset them? Let him, let him hear it through family. You know, I, don't, I, it was, I don't think it was my duty to, to say it, you know. So um, uh, about two weeks later, I saw him sitting under a tree with a handkerchief in his hand. I says, what, what's the matter? Oh, he says, my brother was killed. Oh, I says, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, I had a, I had a you know, you, can you see my point? I, I just didn't want to be the guy to tell him. Uh -huh. Then uh, uh, I said to him, look, uh, uh, let's do something. Let's go to our captain and ask him if we can go to your, your brother's company commander and he get more information about your brother's death. Well, we did. We, went to, we found out where, the, where his brother's unit was. They were in a rest area, so in the woods. So we went there, and there, there this. We asked for Captain So and So, and he was playing cards, on, sitting on the ground playing cards. And we said, "I'm sorry, would you mind?" Um, I said, "This is this is this is the gentleman here is Erickson. I said, "His brother was in your unit. He, he was killed." So he never, he never even looked up from his cards. He says, "Your brother didn't know what hit him." He says, he was killed immediately. That's all I can tell you. Just like that. So we, we got back on our Jeep and went back home. Of course, it didn't make Henderson feel too good, you know. But, I mean, this guy was, this guy was shaken up. This captain was shaken up. He, he wasn't being nasty. He just was shaken. Just to, to know that he was talking to the brother of one of his men, you know. Well, that's not the end of the story. About a month later, he got... Uh, a letter from home saying that his father died with a heart attack. Then the, the campaign started in, in France at the D-Day, and the twin brother 
was burned badly in a tank. And he went back to Walter Reed Hospital by air in a basket. He was burned from head to foot. His mother died with a heart attack. So he got home and uh, he wrote to me in, in January of 46. He says to me, I'm back in the army. He says, there's nothing for me to stay home for. My parents are gone. My brother is dead. My other brother is, we don't know what's going to happen to him. He's still in Walter Reed Hospital. He says, and I, I, I was, I had to, I, I, if the farm is sold, he says, there's no reason for me to stay here at all. So he went back in the army, got married, and, and he asked for, for a time within Tokyo. Okay, we'll, okay. Like we'll go to us no okay. Ready? Now, yeah, that, that's, that story uh, is similar to Saving Private Ryan, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a smaller way, of course. Now, another, another experience we had was uh, when, when the war was over, um, we were up, stationed up in um, near Lake Como, Italy, on Lake Como, Italy. <clears throat> they had a very nice billets for the enlisted men and nice billets across the lake for the officers. So this fellow in my outfit, his, his name was Casey, told me his father, he got a he got the notice moment his father died. They were going to hold the body for five days and he could come home. So uh, he says, he spoke to the captain, the captain says, I'll see what I can do for you. And the captain says, I can't do it. He says, I got a hold of the chaplain, I got a hold of the Red Cross, I got a hold of the commanding officer. He says, and they're all, they're all stalling me. <clears throat> so we sat there and he was kind of, he was pretty kind of down in the dumps, you know, and he said, uh, I really don't, I said, I'm just going to see if I can get a telegram home and tell him to, I can't make it. I said, wait a minute. I said, Casey, hold on, hold on. Let's just get a boat, go across the lake, <clears throat> go to the officer's club over there. Your senator from Massachusetts is in our office. His name is Lodge. You remember Senator Lodge? He was a colonel in Fourth Corps. Let's go over and see him. So we got into a boat and we went across the river, across the lake. And um, there was a party going on in the officers' club. So the MP of the door says, hey, listen, we, just, we can't. Uh, I said, wait a minute. I told him the story about his father. I says, get Senator Lodge out here just for a minute. So he went out and the senator came out, and he was, he was a lieutenant colonel. Then. We told him the story. He says, what's your name? He told him, John Casey. He says, Casey, I'll be with you the first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, he, he came across the lake and he says, uh, there's a truck waiting for you to take you to, Ge to Genoa. There's a plane going back to the States. He says, you just stay there and we'll, we'll discharge you from there. <clears throat> so he says to me, gee, he says, thanks. He says to me, thanks for the suggestion. He says, what can I do for you? I says, will you do me one thing? I says, Listen, make sure you have a, a nickel in your pocket and call my mother when you get to the States. Let's just tell her I'm okay. And he did. I said, I'll give you the nickel. He said, no, 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 no it's okay. But that, that's something I never forgot because it really, you know, I don't know how, how Senator Lodge came to me. This guy was from Boston. I said, look, Casey, he's, he's your senator. Come on. Let him work for you. you know, and, and that's what happened. It worked. Um, what happened after the war? Could you tell a little bit more about your background after the war? Yes. Um, I was trying to do freelance artwork, and it was, it was tough going, really tough going. And I had to bring my sister into this. This is before I met Lillian now. I had, a old, I had two older sisters. They were wonderful. They were like mo extra mothers, you know. And I went to talk to my sister one day, and she and I said, you know, I said, I'm going to really discourage this freelancing. You know, I got a job for $500, and then I don't get another job for six weeks. I says, what does that average out to, you know? It's a tough way to make a living. She says, look, she says, why don't you do this? She says, why don't you go back to school and take something that has more sales value, like um, something to do with your, your engineering, and, uh, you know, there's so much industry going on. I says, that's a good idea. He said, you can always do this on a side. So I says, that's fine, wonderful advice. So I went down to a school in Brooklyn, 
and I, I, I registered, and it, what it was is a, a crash course for, for, G, for uh, GIs. They were, there were many of them around the country where they just, instead of, instead of going to school for four years, you could do it in two years, but it was tough going. I mean, you, like for example, I had one, I had five hours a day of one subject for a year. That's, no, that's, that's, that's a grind for any student, right? Yes. Well, uh, I will never regret it because after I graduated, meanwhile I had met this little charming girl over here, and um, we, were, we got engaged very quickly. I said, now, we don't want to get married, and so it, I get some work, some, a job. Okay. Well, that didn't take long. After I graduated from the school, I was certified. And I, uh, I said, now, where do you want to live? She says, wherever you can find a good job is where we live. So that was, that was a, a big plus for me, because some women don't want to leave home, you know, or leave mama. But anyway, Lillian was ready to, to move anywhere. So I went upstate from Brooklyn, and um, and I was I was talking to my brother, and his friend came in, and he says to me, I was telling him what I was going to do, he says, he says, where are you headed? I said, I'm headed for Schenectady. I says, that General Electric is up there, and I says, uh, American Locomotive is around, I says, I'll, I'll find something. If that doesn't work, I'm going to Detroit. I'll try the automobile business. So he says, look, he says, hey, is it? There's a, there's a place in Kingston here that's looking for a, a designer, mechanical designer. I says, oh. The name of the place was called Electrol Incorporated. They were doing hydraulics for the um, Air Force. So I went there and I, I got hired like that. And um, it, it wasn't a great paying job, but it was a very good um, career start. And I was young yet, you know. And uh, I stayed there for four years, and from there, I went to IBM in Poughkeepsie here, and that's where we moved and bought this house. So that, that's, that's the way my career went. So, so all those years, I recuperated well from polio. I really did. Lee can tell you, I was walking without a cane. I was, I was driving a car, no trouble. I did work on this house here and cut the grass until I was 78 years old, you know. And um, during all that time, I was doing magazine work on the side an IBM job, which was, um, I was in management doing um, uh, manuals. And the artwork I directed, the text preparation I directed, the page layout, and the printing. I charged the whole production for 25 years. That was, it paid well, and it was a very satisfying, very satisfying career. And, um, I retired early. I says to Lillian at 60, I was 60 years old, and uh, they put a, I put a uh, plan on the, on the bulletin board one day, if you want to get out early, uh, this is what the deal is. And I, I, read, I read all this. I says to Lillian, you know what? I said, not going to make me a vice president, so I'm going to leave. I says, and, and I, I took, took my little calculator out and says, if I stay, until I'm 65, I'm going to make $4,000 more a year than I'd be making if I retire. So we chose retirement. I never regretted it. So I, I just, you know, I had enough. I really had enough. That was uh, almost 25 years. I'm going to be 85 in June. So that was 25 years ago. And I never regretted it. I mean, some, some guys say, gee, you shouldn't retire early. If, if, you've, if you've had a good, satisfying job and, you, and you've got an outlook you know, it depends on your outlook on life, you know. Uh, I, would, I was very happy doing that. How do you continue painting? Well, uh, the last few, i got to tell you, I, I walked fine, I did everything fine, until I, about 20 years ago, shortly after I retired, I started to notice a little weakness in the legs. So I went to my doctor locally here, and he sent me to Cornell Medical Center in New York City. And there, a specialist looked at me, and they said, they diagnosed this, what they call post-polio syndrome. It happens to about half the patients when they're old age. <clears throat> and what it does, it's not, the, it's not a return of the disease, it's a, um, a result of it. You can't, you can't do, you just can't do what you used to do. Then, as a, as a, res as a result of that result, I was using my arms more than my legs. And I found out that I was wearing out the, my shoulders. 
So I'm getting to the point about draw, about painting. So uh, go, I'm with the specialist again, and they x-rayed, and they found out that the cartilage in both shoulders was going because of overuse. You do 20, 30 years of overuse, something's going to go. So the advice was surgery. So it was 1997, January 97, I have a prosthesis in the shoulder, the, the rotating cuff. You know, you know the story is there. All plastic and steel now. She called me the bionic man. But, um, but well, okay, I, I come out of that pretty good, you know. I was driving a car and doing things, but, and walking. And then about six months later, I said to Liam, my God, I said, this shoulder was going on me too. Back to, back to the orthopedic specialist. X-rays again. It's worse than this one. Surgery again, 16 months apart. The result of that was that I could not walk, I had to walk with a walker, and I couldn't put the pressure on a walker because of the shoulders. So uh, up until five years ago, I walked, you know, fairly well. Then we had to put the lift in, as you can see over there, and, and kind of the steps, because they got to be pretty tough. So painting calls for this, you know. My arms can't take it, shoulders can't take it. And if you lean on something, you, you may say, oh, painting, you just sit down and paint. You know, you gotta, you gotta put yourself into that thing. You really gotta put, <clears throat> not just the time, but there's a, there's a physical effort that you, you can't believe. And if you don't have the muscle power to do it, you just can't do it. So I haven't painted, but I've done a lot of drawing since then, just playing, where I can lean on a drawing board. And, and you know, but that, that's, that's a great help. And I, st I still feel that I'm a diehard. I feel that I'm going to make my best painting yet. I hope I can do it. I don't know if I can. I'm going to try. Well, we look forward to seeing it. I'd like to thank you very much for thank your... You. That's my pleasure, really. That's Are you guys almost ready for coffee? We do, too. Oh, was have you explained... We'll hold up some of the paintings. <clears throat> okay, have you explained, sure. especially, sure. you know, a couple of the stories you told sure. us? Sure. Uh, okay. I think you explained this first one. You uh, did that one already, right? Yeah, we did this one. Was that on camera about already? That one earlier, right? Yes, we yeah. did. Um, you had a great story about this. This one, yeah. Yes. All right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Just tell me when. Okay, I got it. Okay. That's fine. Uh, this represents Sergeant McNeil of the 14th Regiment, who was captured by uh, J.E.B. Stewart's men, cavalry, and as a prisoner, he was interviewed by the general, who says to him, if you stay with us, we'll give you a, a higher rank and a horse, and you can be a southern cavalryman. And, and I'm showing him here saying, you can offer me no inducement great enough to make me fight against the Union. Well, not too long after that, he was paroled, and sent back to the 14th Regiment, and in due time, he was promoted to captain. That's a story on, on Sergeant McNeil. Now this one, excuse me, this one shows Sergeant Frank Head, who was the color bearer of the 14th. He was 21 years old, and in the first hour of the, of the Battle of um, Bull Run, the first Bull Run, he was struck in the chest by a bullet, and when he went down, his friends came to him and tried to help him, and he said, his famous words were, never mind me, boys, save the cause. And he was taken away and uh, died a short time later. Twenty-one years old, became immortal. Okay, thank you. Now, this, is, this one is a, is a typical soldier of the famous New York 69th Regiment, which everyone knows about because they made movies of it and there were many stories. And uh, their, their uh, part in the, in the Civil War was great, absolutely great. And of course, they distinguished themselves in, in two world wars.
Am I sure that okay? Fine. Uh, the night before the first Battle of Bull Run, the 14th Regiment fellows got together. They would they were sat around a, a campfire singing songs. And they were joined with the blue blue pants fellows you see here uh, from other other units, and they um, they just had a great time singing songs about mostly about home and family. Okay. This is another version of um, of Sergeant um, Head, Frank Head. At the time he was shot, it, it's a it's a it's a mate mate to the one I showed you first. Um, okay, thank you. This one shows just about the, the beginning of the battle of the first battle of Bull Run, in 1861. The 14 going into action. They were in a place called the behind some barn. I can't think of the name of the, of the house it belonged to, but they called it the slaughter pen. There were so many men killed on both sides within one hour. And the Battle of Bull Run was um, really lost by the North. Matter of fact, both matter of fact, few people realize it, but this, the North was losing the war until Gettysburg. They weren't doing too well. Yeah, he's back trying to tie it. Okay. Oops. Okay. They can both hold this one, all right? Yes, sir. Can you see that one all right? Fine. Okay. This one was used for the, for the cover of um, Civil War Times in um, 1972. Now, why was that on the cover? Well, I, I submitted photographs of all the paintings and the text uh -huh. to the magazine editor. Okay, so you did an article for that issue yes, also? Yes, the written article was in here too, yes. And the, um, the editor chose this one for the cover. And the article, I'm, I, I, I'm very happy to say, was very well received by the public. And uh, I received quite a few letters on it. And, um, it was my pleasure to do it because the 14th, uh, you know, had, had plenty of publicity, but this, this helped them quite a bit. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry. There's the, there's, the, there's the frontispiece and the beginning of the story there. Okay. Why did you have so much interest in the 14th Brooklyn? Well, first of all, my older brother was in it when I was a kid, and then I joined it myself. So, and the, everybody in that neighborhood in Brooklyn, you know, the 14th was, was part of our, part of our culture, you might say, you know, in, in that particular area of Brooklyn, South Brooklyn. So they were all, um, and I said to you before, the, the, uh, the pride, when I was in it, I couldn't believe that these young fellas who had fathers and brothers in it before us, like I did, you know. They, they took a great pride in being part of the 14th. You know, it should be that way. In any I case. think that's what a lot of people don't realize, the, how much of a social yes. uh, group these yes. uh, regiments were at that time. Yeah, in a matter of fact, a matter of fact um, during the time I was in the 14th, they had two, two dances they held uh, in the armory, which had a magnificent parquet floor throughout the whole armory. And the 14th Regiment Band, they were, they, were good. they were a terrific marching band, but they were also, I didn't realize, they were a terrific dance band. And so we, we were on the floor, we had a great time, both dances, good World War II. And one of the, the, one of the, one of the things that I was very, a source of pride too, before I went into the regular army, they had a, a, a very special day in June 1942 called New York at War Day. And um, I think the mayor then, I, th I think it was, was still the Guardia, it was 142 year. And we went by the reviewing stand, the 14th was invited to march in it. And we marched from, you know where the, where the Museum of um, Art is on 86, I think it's 86th Street? We started there and we didn't, we didn't stop until we got on 23rd Street by the subway station and we went, we were all absolutely soaking wet. You can see the guy in front of you, you can see a uh, sweat mark on his back. And it got, got bigger and bigger and bigger until finally our backs are all soaking wet. 
And uh, we, when we got to that 23rd Street, our commanding officer says, okay, fellas, right in the subway say we're going right back to Brooklyn. Let's get out of here. That's enough. That was a great day. I mean, we, we saw quite a few dignitaries on a, on a reviewing stand, including, including the mayor, Mayor LaGuardia, who was himself was a very colorful, colorful figure. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome, I'm sure. It's wonderful. Central Park? Is it yes, yeah, yes. Down Fifth Avenue. Yes, down Fifth Avenue. This is it. This is it. By golly. I couldn't, I couldn't believe wow. anybody took a picture of it. <laughs> Somebody did? Kids. Can you uh, spin it around and I'll take a shot? Right up front. Right, right over there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he used to draw cards for IBM, the retirees. And he always drew two cards. And out of that, they gave him about 40 to 50 large ones, the company did. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have to pay. So whenever anybody came, okay, I did, got it. Okay, he would give it to them. So my granddaughter has them all over her living room. Thank you, sir. Thank you.